EMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. All right, good evening, everyone. We're going to call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board meeting on March 18th, 2024. My name is Rachel Zemberry. I am the chair of the Redevelopment Board. And if the other members of the board could please introduce themselves, I'd appreciate it. Steve Revelock, good evening. Eugene Benson. Shana Corman Houston. Ken Lowell. Thank you. And we have um, Claire Ricker from the Department of Planning and Community Development joining us uh, on the uh, board here this evening as well. Let's see. So let's go ahead and move right into our first uh, agenda item, which is a review of the meeting minutes from March 4th, 2024. And I will see if there are any additions or corrections, starting with Ken. I have none. Uh, Shana? None. Jean? None. Steve? No additional. And I do not have any either, so we will uh, see if there is a vote to, uh, excuse me, if there is a motion to approve the meeting minutes as submitted. So motion. Second. We'll take a vote starting with Steve? Yes. Jean? Yes. Shana? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. The meeting minutes have been approved. Uh, so our second um, agenda item is the um, continuation of the public hearing for the Warren Articles for 2024 Annual Town Meeting. Um, we have two sections of um, the uh, hearing for this evening. The first will be uh, to um, see if there is any uh, public comment for Article 31, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment related to five to seven winter, uh, add, excuse me, to adding five to seven winter street to the MBTA neighborhood district. Um, we will be opening this uh, as the public notice to the, excuse me, the um, certified notice to the abutters went out directly following the March 4th uh, hearing. Um, so uh, if there are any abutters who received that notice joining us this evening who would uh, like to speak, if you could indicate so by raising your hand. Okay, seeing none, we will uh, close the uh, comment for article, public comment for article 31. Um, now that we have concluded that item, we will move into the board deliberation and voting on each of the articles. Um, as we have done in the past, what I would like to do is um, take uh, deliberation on each article and we will um, we will take a vote at that time as soon as we complete the discussion for each article. Then we will run through at the end um, to ensure that we have um, recorded the votes accordingly. So with that, um, we will move to Article 25. Just one uh, request of the board. Um, we will be building the uh, board report um, to town meeting based on the uh, comments uh, that the board has uh, put forth uh, both during the public hearing as well as this evening. So if as we deliberate and prepare to take the vote, we could make sure to clearly articulate um, the points of view both for and or um, against recommending action for each of the zoning articles that would greatly aid with the preparation of the redevelopment board's report. So let us start with uh, Article 25, uh, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment related to building definitions, and we will start with any discussion, uh, starting with Ken. No, I have uh, no issues with this. I would like to uh, move this ahead. This is a uh, clerical, and uh, it clears up uh, some uh, ambiguities between the uh, two definitions. So this is making it easier. So I agree with this. Great. Thank you, Ken. Um, and I'll just note that this was uh, one of the zoning bylaw amendments that was discussed together with uh, Christian Klein and um, originally discussed by the Zoning Board of Appeals before it came uh, before us ahead of the, um, the Warren article process. So we'll start uh, with Deshaina for any commentary. Um, I agree entirely with Ken. This seems to me to be a sensible clarification and, um, and I support moving it forward. 
Great, thank you. Jean? Yeah, I'll just add that um, Mr. Klein and I met with Mike Champa to discuss this, and this is where we ended up because there was a question about whether there were some buildings that fell into neither building attached nor building detached, and they have to be one or the other. So this cleared up that ambiguity, and it cleared it up in the way that inspectional services has been interpreting these sections. Thank you for that clarification, Gene. Steve, any commentary? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, I think it's important for us to make these kind of uh, clarifications so that the bylaw is easier to interpret and apply. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, I will see if there is a motion to um, uh, vote to recommend um, uh, recommend uh, favorable action for uh, Article 25 for Springtown meeting. Yes. Motion to take a uh, uh, favorable action. So second. Great. And we will take a vote starting with Steve. Yes. Uh, Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the board will recommend uh, favorable action for uh, Article 25 with a vote of 5 to 0. Thank you. We'll now move on to Article 26, which is another administrative clarification. Um, this is related to the citations for uh, residential di the residential district yard and open space requirements. Uh, so any discussion, starting with Ken? No, I have no discussions. Uh, I'm in favor of this uh, clarification. Great. Thank you, Shana. Um, again, I agree with Ken. I have no discussion. I agree with this clarification. Gene. Yeah, I'll just add that while this specifically notes the additional exception, that exception is already found elsewhere, and Mr. Klein asked us to add this just so, as, as Mr. Revlock said about the previous article, it just makes the bylaw clearer and easier to understand to have this extra cross-reference. Yep, great, thank the, you. The only thing I will add is that when we get to town meeting, we'll need to ask town meeting or the moderator to take up Article 27 before Article 26, because Article 27 changes how the subsections are enumerated, and this exception is for those amended subsections. Great, or, or we can also ask him to uh, add both to the consent agenda. Well, I would hope he does. Great, perfect. Um, Steve? I am supportive of the additional citation. Great, thank you. Is there a motion to recommend a favorable action for Article 26? Motion to take favorable action on Article 26. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Shana? Yes. Jean? Uh, Jean? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We will recommend favorable action on Article 26, the vote of 5 to 0. All right, let's now move to Article 27, which is an administrative uh, correction related to uh, creating a clarification by replacing the bullets in section 5.9.2, subsection B, with letters, so that it is consistent with the uh, balance of the zoning bylaws and the way that they are notated. We'll start with Ken for any, uh, any discussion on this topic. I have no discussion on this topic. I think I'm in favor of this topic. It makes the reading of the codes simpler and easier to, to follow. Great, thank you. Shana? Uh, I agree. I have no discussion. I think it would be great to move this forward for clarity's sake. Great, thank you. Jean? And uh, Mr. Klein also asked us to make this change so it would be easier for the Zoning Board of Appeals to cite this when it references the subsection. I'll point out that we also are deleting a subsection that is no longer needed because the date has passed. Forward. Thank you. So that's the other part of this. And I agree with all of you. Uh, Steve? 
Yes, um, I, I'm in support of this. I think it'll make it easier to cite individual provisions of Section 592B. Um, I'd also like to offer a small clarification to the public regarding, you know, in response to one of the letters that the board received. Um, Please. So this article is not proposing to add provisions for accessory dwelling units. These are already exist in the bylaw. They've been there for several years. We are just changing a bulleted list to an enumerated list in a section which already exists and striking uh, one provision which is no longer relevant. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Steve. Any other discussion? Is there a vote to, or excuse me, a motion to vote to uh, recommend favorable action for Article 27? Motion to uh, favorable action on Article 27. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Uh, so the board will recommend favorable action for Article 27 with a vote of five to zero. We'll now move to Article 28 which is an amendment to delete the Inland Wetland Overlay District. And we'll start discussion with Ken. Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with this. Uh, this came from uh, Comscom, to clarify, because it was redundant. And I believe Comscom is, uh, regulations are more strict than this right here. So I think this is good. Great, thank you, Shana. Um, Yes, agreed. I think this is a great clarification. If I recall, CONCOM's concern was by and large one of jurisdiction um, and and struggling uh, struggling to identify who had jurisdiction of certain areas of town um, uh, and wanted to make sure that that. A, the most stringent regs and most current regs were um, being followed and that if there was a problem, it was clear who uh, <coughs> who had the jurisdiction to, um, to address those issues. And so I, uh, I know there were questions from the community about would this would this weaken environmental protections in town? And what we hear from Dave, from David Morgan is that no, in fact, um, functionally, it should strengthen um, strengthen protections. Great, thank you, uh, Gene. Yes, I'll, I'll add that um, Mr. Klein also asked us to um, delete this section because it completely overlapped the jurisdiction of the Zoning Board of Appeals in certain cases with the Conservation Commission unnecessarily because they end up doing the exact same thing. And the conservation agent assured us that um, the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission through state wetlands law, state wetlands regulations, the town bylaw, and the town regulations on wetlands cover the same ground adequately, and therefore there's no need to have these regulations or these this in the zoning bylaw anymore. That, um, the state regulations on wetlands and the town bylaw and regulations on wetland have been strengthened over the years. So this might have been necessary when it was first put into the uh, zoning bylaw, but it's superfluous at this point. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I, I think the Conservation Commission is the most appropriate body to adjudicate issues related to wetlands. <laughs> And I think the removal of this section from the zone bylaw will clarify which body has uh, jurisdiction over such matters. I'd also like to uh, express my appreciation to the conservation agent for working on this and to the Conservation Commission for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Could you advance the, the sure. slides, please? Thank sorry. you. Is there a motion? Uh, any other discussion? All right, is there a motion to uh, recommend favorable action on Article 28? Motion to uh, 
Okay, we'll action article 28. Second. We'll take a vote starting with Steve. Uh, yes. Jean. Yes. Sheena. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We'll recommend action with a vote of five to zero. Great, let's move to article 29, which is uh, the reduced height buffer. Um, and I do want to make sure that we have the most recent text up on the screen. That is it. Um, and we'll start discussion this time with Steve, since um, I know that you had, uh, uh, you, you uh, helped us with the edits for the most uh, current version. Yeah, so um, after the uh, board's hearing on this, earlier hearing on this article, uh, I went back and compared the language in the bylaw today with what was in the, the warrant from special town meeting of 1975. And they are in fact identical with two exceptions. The two exceptions are the mention of the R0 and open space districts, which were not part of the bylaw in 1975. So and in particular, the height buffer distances of 200 foot, 150 feet, and 150, and 100 feet have been unchanged um, since the bylaw was adopted in, in 1975. Now, as I had mentioned during the, an earlier hearing night, um, in the intervening years, there were some significant down zoning and height reductions in the B5, R7, and planned unit development districts. And, you know, as in my efforts to sort of research the background of this, um, I could find no discussion of, you know, changing the height buffers distances to reflect the, re the reduced height. So I think it's, um, you know, it's a, in effect, it's an internal consistency that's crept into the bylaw over the over the last few years, and I, you know, I'm supportive of changing it. Um, I had proposed, you know, roughly cutting the distances in half because that <coughs> is approximately, you know, what the height reductions work out to across the the districts affected. Um, but you know, I'm. You know, that, that, that was uh, sort of my opening suggestion. I welcome you know, additional comment on whether those distances, I, I think there's some one that I can, I can make a compelling story for, but I'm open to other options. Great, thank you. Jean. Can, um, if I could ask Mr. Revel, I have a please, question. Please, please. When, when the down zoning happened in those districts, uh -huh. what was the height before and what was the height after? So the first district to be down zoned was R7. Uh, this was 1978. The height limit went from 110 feet to 60. The second district to be down zoned was a planned unit development district, and it went from 200 feet to, I forget if it was 80 or 85, one of those two. And the third was the B5 district, which was 1987, and that also started at 110 feet, and I believe it went down to 75. I think it's important to point out that this is only for those very few instances where the bylaw allows two different heights in a district and not most of the bylaw. So this is a very limited application and when and this clearly seems to be there to prevent shadows. And if you've lowered the height that's permissible, you're therefore lowering also how large the shadows will be cast. So it certainly makes sense, in my opinion, when the areas have been down zoned where there are two possible height limits to also allow um, the lower amount here. And it's also important, I think, to point out that we always had the ability, when something came before us, to allow the upper height limit if we felt it didn't have any adverse impact based on the criteria in 3.3, which is special permits, and 3.4, which is environmental design review. So all this does is add a little more certainty going forward as to what the um, minimum um, 
buffer should be. So that makes sense to me to do it under those circumstances. Um, Steve, could I? I think probably, Steve, you're the most likely to know the answer to this. Do you have any idea how many parcels this impacts? I was trying, I was looking through the map today. I counted only about a half dozen, but I'm sure I was missing some. I have never not made an attempt to count the number of parcels impacted by this provision of the bylaw. Okay. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, figured if anyone knew, it would be you. Uh, so so I, th I think Jane is right, though, that it's not very many. Um, uh, and and also and also agree with both of you that in the context of reducing the height um, of the zoning, a reduced buffer makes a lot of sense. Um, I thought that I I thought that the change from um, the change from the initial proposal of 50 feet, 35 feet, 25 feet, uh, back up to 175 and 50 was a little bit drastic. I did think the adjustment upward was probably was probably merited. Um, somewhere in the middle seemed uh, seemed a little more appropriate to me, but um, <clears throat> but I would certainly be willing to be convinced otherwise. Great, thank you, Ken. I'm um, agree with Jean and uh, Steve on this. I think this is the proper adjustment uh, for what I believe was something that maybe was left out. Uh, and I agree with this, and I think we should move this forward. Great, thank you. Claire, did the uh, department have any other um, clarifications? I know that you were taking a look at some other sure. nearby towns. So we took a look um, at the um, uh, the height limits that were suggested in Kevin Lyman's uh, memo of last year where we went 50, 35, and 25. And what we discovered was that the research that was done um, related to reduced height buffer was actually um, applicable to the rear yard setback that we were working on. Um, and so sort of reflective of that, that is where these heights came from in the in initial. Concert with it, the exactly. Okay. And so because we did the work last fall of the um, variable rear yard setback, um, those heights that were suggested initially, um, you know, are, are no longer applicable. And Steve's suggestion, his Revelock's suggestion, um, is is more of a middle of the road proposition. Um, communities uh, adjacent to us. So Simmonville has a form-based code, so they are less likely to have a direct comparison. But some um, communities adjacent to us, like Belmont, for example, increases setbacks when adjacent to residential uh, neighborhoods. Medford has. Um, side yard requirements and height limits um, vary based on adjacent residential districts. So these suggestions, you know, and, and Steve's height um, um, proposal um, does sort of uh, uh, jive with our uh, with our adjacent communities or with our abutting communities, um, although they don't necessarily spell it out as a reduced height buffer. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, any other discussion? I, I think I'll add that with a couple exceptions, the difference in the height between the higher and the lower is only 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so we're not talking about the difference between a two-story building and a six-story building. We're talking about the difference between either a three and a four-story building or a four-story building and a five-story building. So, so we're not talking about a huge disparity in the height of the buildings between the higher and the lower number. So I think that supports um, reducing the buffer area. Great. Thank you, Jean. Any other discussion? Great. Is there a motion to recommend favorable action for Article 29? Motion to uh, motion for favorable action on Article 29. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean? Yes. Shana? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will recommend favorable action with a vote of 5 to 0. All right, let's move to the next item, which is uh, shaded parking lots. And I believe that we have the um, latest up. 
update on the uh, article language on the screen. Uh, and we will start discussion with Ken. Uh, well, I always had issues with uh, this article. <laughs> I think it was too much of a burden on uh, businesses, um, owners, and developers um, to improve their property and to develop. I think when people, I think when uh, people come up to us. And when we ask for more trees, or additional trees, they've been happy to do so. I have not seen any pushback in my seven, eight years here that, uh, that someone has said, no, we're not going to add it on tree because you asked for it. So I don't think this is uh, a good uh, <coughs> amendment to put in right now. I think uh, this is uh, just adding more stuff that uh, would discourage well, one more step that we make it harder for an owner to upkeep his property or and so forth. So I'm not in favor of it right now, but I'm willing to talk about it. Great. Um, I'll add as well um, that I, I find this too prescriptive. Um, again, I think it's a solution in search of a, a problem, um, especially given the size of most of the developments that, that we see here in town. Um, I'm certainly in favor of um, adding uh, shade trees and landscaping. I think that the, you know, the Redevelopment Board has been very good at working on creative solutions with the developers that have come in front of us. Um, and, and again, be, because of that ability to work on creative solutions, um, I think that um, the way that, that this is written is, is, is quite frankly too prescriptive, and we started to talk about that a little bit in terms of the, um, the distance um, that each parking space is required to be um, from, from the shade trees specifically as, as one of the things that is challenging. Um, so again, I'm happy to talk about it, but as it stands right now, I'm not in favor of this. Shana. Um, I, I first really appreciate uh, Ms. Stamps and Ms. Carr Jones bringing this in front of us uh, and the rest of the tree committee bringing this to us. Um, um, really appreciate concern about heat islands and runoff. Um, and the other environmental issues raised in Arlington's built environment um, uh, and do appreciate quite a bit your flexibility working with us on an ongoing basis trying to craft something that would work for for developers uh, because because prescriptiveness uh, has been a concern I think that you've gotten it to a place that works for me, and um, and I would be comfortable moving it forward. But uh, but I but I do uh, recognize my committee members, uh, my for fellow board members' concerns about the prescriptiveness of um, of the measure um, as being as being a valid point. I think we I think you have moved it along enough that. It's gotten me comfortable, though. Great. Thank you. Jean. Claire, can you put up the photo that I asked to be added to the materials for today? It's the photo of um, the Whole Foods parking lot. No, that's not, that's not it. Oh. Yep, that's it. Thanks. Now, the reason I wanted to show this photo, um, the proponents of the article showed a photo of the Whole Foods parking lot last time. The reason I wanted to show this photo, and I'm going to get up for a second to sure. show you what I'm talking about. Is it's written on two sides by trees. Here. Jean, I'm so sorry. Can I just ask you to stand on the other side so that the camera can catch what you're pointing at? Thank you. Here and here. And uh, this was obviously taken in the summer. I'm guessing it was sometime just before noon, because this is um, the east side. This is the south side, if I've gotten it correct. And you can see 
This entire area is shaded by trees, reducing the heat island effect. This entire area is also shaded by trees. And what you can't tell by looking at this is that there are parking spaces all over here and parking spaces all along here. And if you're like me and you drive there on a hot summer day, the first thing you look and see is a shaded parking space along one of these two sides where I can go and park. And in the summer, what I have found is that these are the spaces that are taken up first. So I said to um, the proponents, I think your oracle makes perfect sense because I think we as a town should be doing as much as we can to counter um, climate disruption. And to the extent that we can have zoning that reduces heat island effect on private property, that helps all of us. And we did that a little bit last year by MBTA zoning, by requiring green space in front where people could plant trees, things like that. So we have a history of doing that. We've done that by requiring solar on roofs in places, things like that also. So I said to them, I like your article, but I think you should add something that says, if there are trees off the property that provide shade, we can count that. And they said, great, and that got added to the article as a result of that. So if Whole Foods were to build this parking lot today, and all the trees are there, all those trees could be counted toward the shade. And they need very little additional trees, actually, to meet the requirements. One of the other things I like about this, and I think it's appropriately prescriptive, a lot of the times what we've said, and we just said this about the article with um, the reduced height buffer zones, which is, you know, to the extent that we can add some certainty to builders, it makes sense. So rather than we doing our terrific job, which we often do, trying to get um, builders and developers to add more landscaping, if they know it's coming, they can um, plan their, their par parking lot that way. So this, I think, is not overly prescriptive. I think it's appropriately prescriptive. And what the proponents did is they actually increased the spacing for the trees a little bit based upon comments um, that they got. Um, the only other thing I will add and why I think this is a good idea is it's similar to the requirements that already exist for parking lots and industrial zones. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to have one set of requirements for parking lots in industrial zones and yet not have them for parking lots in other parts of town. And I do point out that currently at least 8% of the parking lots must be landscaped anyhow, and a lot of these trees could fit within the 8% area. So I don't think we're putting a real burden. And I think if there's any minor burden, it's much offset by the increased certainty, um, the reduction in heat island effect. And I know the town has its job to do with trees along sidewalks and planting pits. But private people, private places also have a job that they can do, and zoning requires that a lot of time. So I think this is a good idea. I appreciate the changes that the proponents made, and I would like to support this. Thank you. Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, although parking lots of this size, 25 units plus, um, you know, we have them, uh, but they're not something that typically comes before the board. Though I expect that you know properties do turn over, and it's you know, not completely without reason that we'll see one of these in the future. Um, to the extent that we can do something to mitigate heat islands as these lots are constructed, I'm in support of this. I'd also like to express some appreciation to the proponents for willing to have a di their willingness to have a dialogue and and kind of negotiate um, to come up with some, to come up with some what I think is a fairly good proposal. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Yeah. 
Gene, uh, you bring up a good point on one project, and I think the whole, the whole green site is is a good argument for you. But you didn't. But let's pick up another argument that's not in there. Okay, and let's say there's so many park. Let's say you have if you want to build a, a mixed use building, and you know. Uh, parking is very expensive. If you want to put it on the ground, that's almost 10 times the cost of putting it surface parking. So you're talking about surface parking here, which is very uh, vital, and then you want to have landscaping and so forth. But taking away some cars so you put parking in there or make it less efficient, it makes, makes it harder uh, to, to, to encourage that, those, kind of, those kinds of projects. And, I think we do well enough job getting that uh, those, those trees. You know, we t when we see those projects, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not arguing with you saying um, having heat islands is good. I think it's bad, but I, I think taking this approach for this kind of new development is 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 not the the low hanging fruit we can get at. Yes, I think we should uh, look at this and look at areas where we can put more trees, but not at the cost of other things. So I'm just trying to balance the two out of, of looking at future development or future renovations, upkeep, because people are not going to want to do things. They know if, if they, once they pass a certain threshold, now they're bound to put more trees in and, and this and that. It just makes it hotter. For someone who wants to make their property look nicer, or for someone to to do the, uh, do their project, I'm not agree I'm not disagreeing with what you, what you say. It's a good thing, but I just think it's it's a, it's a harder burden to, to put on someone that's going to hold back uh, as town this town going forward in in um, uh, making more housing, making more businesses, and so forth like that, and. I think if, if we went ahead and looked at and spent the same energy and looking at all the places where we can get rid of the heat islands, I think that's better served than at, at the cost of what we need, uh, what this may be costing a burden to. That's that's my belief right now, okay? And I, I feel strongly about that. Um, other discussion? I think just one item I wanted to pick up. I know that we had talked about looking at parking in, in general, and again, that was mostly around um, TDM plans and other things uh, starting this this summer. Um, again, I still feel that this this is too prescriptive. I think that there are creative ways that we've worked with developers in the past, and um, I actually have appreciated some innovative ideas that they've brought with regard to their landscaping plans. Um, you know, if, if we if the majority of the board moves this forward, you know. That's, we can certainly move forward in that way, but uh, we could also take a look at this um, in concert with the other parking reviews that we are planning on doing starting this summer. Other thoughts? Gene. A couple of things. One is currently parking lots of 25, more than 25 spaces as this is, requires at least 8% of it to be landscaped anyhow. So I don't see this as a particularly large burden. And additionally, they have to have landscape buffers where they can also put trees. So I, I see this as a very minor burden at the most. And it was just a year ago that we agreed to, uh, or two years ago, recommend a change in the zoning bylaw requiring developers to plant sweet trees 25 feet apart unless they didn't fit. So I, I do think um, that this is the way to go. And I think that the other things we're going to be looking at in parking is not this. It's going to be a lot of other things about parking. And I think um, this can go ahead now. Great. Any other discussion? Jean, is you, can you tell me your read of this? Um, 
My, my read is that a tree could be put inside the 8% landscaped area. Is that your read as well? Yep. yep. Okay. Nothing prevents it. That's In fact, right. I would expect that's where a lot of them yep. go. Yep. That was my expectation as well. Yeah. Well, I would like to make a motion for a favorable report on... Um, for favorable uh, action? Favorable action on Article 30 as as it's submitted now. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. Great. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean? Yes. Shana? Yes. Ken? No. And I'm a no as well. So we will recommend favorable action uh, by a vote of three to two. Uh, let's now move to Article 31, which is uh, related to adding five to seven Winter Street to the MBTA Neighborhood District. And we will start our discussion with Kim. Um, well, we originally did the MBTA Neighborhood District. Um, our intention was to um, leave historic buildings alone and not include that in, in the projects. Just so we, so we're not um, going ahead and destroying all the nice buildings we have here. And uh, as Juan as brought up to us, uh, that uh, there's other projects that have not been that we admitted, um, not on purpose, just you know, due to the sheer nature of all the numbers of uh, projects. The other. Um, historic buildings that we have missed. Uh, and that he brings up, uh, the report uh, also brought out the fact that this project is, is uh, located right behind the row of, uh, of uh, businesses right now that uh, is basically uh, uh, hemmed in and cannot, the whole block of uh, businesses are only 30. 40 feet deep, something like that, and impossible to do anything with what's, what, what's there right now, which is basically a mom and pop store that can barely survive. Um, so, uh, I'm in favor of this uh, article uh, based on uh, the owner's request and uh, feedback we've gotten from the meetings. Great, thank you. Shana. Um, I think it's a very reasonable and appropriate site for uh, the MBTA communities. I do recognize that its omission was intentional, but I, I believe that the demo, um, demo delay protections and other protections in um, <clears throat> Uh, in historic regs should uh, be sufficient to protect um, to protect the historic fabric on the site in a, in an appropriate manner, um, and I would recommend favorable action. Thank you, Jean. I agree substantively it should be added to the zone. I cannot agree due to the procedural defects and I want to explain that um, sure. to the board. As, as many of you may recall, the zoning bylaw says that before the petition, petitioner files to change the zoning, the petitioner must, by certified or <coughs> registered mail, notify the abutters of the petition. Um, that didn't happen in this case, even though when the petitioner came to us months ago, I said to the petitioner, there are notices that must be followed. So I had, and then um, Rachel had uh, a series of email communications with town council about this. And um, town council, I think, ends up basically saying, the question at this stage is whether the opportunity for public comment has passed. In other words, Mr. Leone sent out the registered mail after we had closed public comment 
on all of the articles. However, um, our chair opened public comment on this article and there was nobody here to provide public comment. However, I will note nobody had noticed that public comment would reopen. And if you look at the materials that Mr. Leone sent to the abutters, it did not inform them that they would have the opportunity to make public comment tonight. What I would suggest we do, rather than vote on this, is to have Mr. Leone send out another notice indicating that there will be the opportunity for public comment and that we have public comment on this for the abutters at our next um, regularly scheduled meeting. And if they don't come, then we can vote in favor if we all think it's in favor. If they do come, then they'll have an opportunity to say whatever they want and we can make the decision. But if we don't give them a real opportunity to come and make public comment after getting the, um, the notice, I don't think I can vote in favor. On procedural grounds, although on a substantive ground, it makes perfect sense to me to add it to the zone. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Steve, I will uh, see what comments you have, and then I'd like to talk about timing for Jean's suggestion before we um, have a discussion around what his specific suggestion is. Uh, uh, substantive, substantively, I am in support of the, um, the trustee's request to have the property included in the overlay district given uh, its location and the fact that surrounding adjacent properties were also included, I, I think it's reason I think it, the request is entirely reasonable. Great, thank you. Um, so Claire, I just want to look at our calendar here. Um, so our next meeting is April 1st, Correct. at which time we were planning on reviewing and approving the notice, or excuse me, the ARB report to town meeting. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, the reports to town meeting are due by April 8th, so we would need to, Jean, I don't know that we have the, um, I don't know that the calendar is on our side to be able to prepare a report, post it, for a public meeting and have a public meeting um, and vote on that report if we pushed it to April 1st. Um, the meeting tonight was uh, publicly posted. Um, and again, I, I did review that with town council. Um, I understand where you're you're coming from and and um, uh, my my um, and again I, I personally have to go with what um, our town council has recommended um, and Mike Cunningham did did review this um, but again I'm open to discussion of the other board members if, if you have thoughts on, on timing or share Jean's concerns about the procedural. Is, so you're saying town council is fine with, uh, with this right now? They sent a letter, or he sent a note today, and Jean referenced it, identifying um, that the opportunity for public comment on Article 31 um, tonight um, satisfies the um, requirements in um, in uh, the town requirements for um, the availability for a butter comment. If, if I may, I can Please. read. What, what uh, town council wrote is although section 5.1 contemplates that evidence of such copies, that is, that the notices have been sent by certified or registered mail, be shown in the petition. If the petitioner can show that has been done prior to the close of the public hearing and comment period, it's my opinion, his opinion, 
that substantial compliance with the bylaw has occurred. Accordingly, the question at this stage is whether the opportunity for public comment has passed. Now, we did close public comment at the end of the last meeting. Um, if a butter who received the proposal from the petitioner um, appeared at tonight's ARB meeting under the posted agenda, section two, public hearing war articles, would that person be permitted to offer testimony? If so, then because substantial compliance has been achieved prior to the close of public comment, ARB may consider the war article. So that's what he says. My response to that is, they, haven't, they were not given notice that we have reopened for the sole purpose of having their comment. Yeah, I'm just seeing this letter tonight, and it, it does not mention tonight's hearing. It does hearing. not mention it. So I feel like what, what we can do is have staff prepare the report, and when it comes to um, this Warren article, it can be written two ways. One is a favorable report, and another is an unfavorable report, and we will have notice given to the abutters and if um, and put it on the agenda for the next meeting. And if they don't come, then they they had notice. If they do come and they have things to say, then we'll make a decision. Uh, thoughts on that timing? Looks like it was enough time. Well, I, it, it does if we proceed as as Jean um, proposes, which is we would um, we would hold that particular vote, prepare. It's um, a fairly we uh, would prepare an article. We've all indicated support, so we could prepare a. Um, section of the board report um, relative to um, favorable action. Um, if there is um, a butter discussion that changes our perspective at that meeting, we can certainly, we've, we've substantially edited the redevelopment report um, in in place and then voted on the amended report in the past. Steve. Well, I was wondering, um, now granted there's throwing it out. Please. Could we have a short meeting next Monday? So I'm, I'm taking it today is the 18th, the 25th, and then we have the 25th and then April 1st. Um, so a, a brief meeting on the 25th to accept public comment. I can't be here. I have concert tickets on the No, nope, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I mean, I, I honestly don't think we need to add another meeting. I think okay. what Jean is suggesting um, could be su sufficient. Um, I think two things have to happen. One is our agenda has to say there'll be public comment on this article. Specifically on this article. On this article. And we would ask Mr. Leone to send by certified or registered the gentleman. Oh, sir, 100 bucks to you. Again, to notice, so to notice to, and mailing already. to notice it. I just I have one comment, and that is that um, 65 days after the close of the warrant, we are supposed to, um, you know, hold our hearings and, and take votes to uh, votes on the warrant office. Excuse me. I want to make sure that we are within that time frame. If we're going to, um, I think initially we had planned on April 1st being the, um, the deliberation yes. vote meeting. We're actually ahead of schedule, but I just want to double check and make sure um, with town council that we're able to do that. Um, that we've met that 65 day threshold. I think we have, but I want to make sure. Gene. Um it sounds like we're all in favor of it, okay? And if we approve it, what's the risk of uh, it being overturned? Because we didn't follow the procedure correctly. Town Council said that um, all of the abutters had due process rights. And that if they didn't receive notice appropriately, 
they could raise a due process concern. That's basically what he said in one of the emails. Uh, again, I, I am going to go by what, um, again, I discussed with town council this morning, that by allowing public comment um, this evening and the fact that the notices did go out, um, that the um, requirements, personally, I, I believe that they have been met. But I respect, you know, if you are reading that in a different way. Ken? No, I'm, I'm going to go with you. I, I did not talk to town council, so I, I, I don't have a first hand knowledge about it. I believe that what you said is, is fine. And if we have to, um, if, we're, if you know, if we did something wrong, we did something wrong. Uh, Again, it wouldn't be the, the board, it's the pe petitioner um, would, would have to start over, you know, so again, this is part of, you also <laughs> um, have a vested interest in this, and if you are at all concerned about us voting action and moving forward, and then one of the abutters raising a um, concern, if you feel that there um, is a potentially different way of reading this than how our discussion with town council. Yes. Um, well, again, if if you would like to um, withdraw, then that would be really the only other option at this point. Ma may, may I? Again, I'm, I'm asking, yeah, so yeah, one of the reasons why we... I, I think we're fine. I, my reading of the bylaw meant before the town meeting. It didn't specifically say before this board. It said before the petition is presented. My petition is to the town meeting, not to the ARB. So I thought my notice was fine because it's way before town meeting. The abutters can appear at town meeting and address town meeting and be, have their due process rights heard there. The, the way the bylaw reads, it does not specifically say this board. So Thank I you. thought we were fine in our interpretation of it. The bylaw is a little bit ambiguous as to which board I'm supposed to be addressing. Um, regarding my certified mail, we sent those out to the eight, 11 people. It was nearly $100. We sent out $162 worth of mailings to, oh my God, or yeah, like over 300 people. Two people showed up last time, and we haven't been contacted by anybody. So I would ask the board to please proceed tonight, and I'll take my chances with the due process if they decide to address it like, at that point in time. So Great. I, I think it's town meeting and not this board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments, Sheena? Um, I think I agree with you, Rachel, that uh, if town council feels comfortable, I feel comfortable moving this forward. Great. Um, uh, Steve? Nothing further. Jean, anything else? Um, I think I've said all I need to say. Okay. Um, is there a motion to recommend favorable action for Article 31? Motion to move favorable action on Article 30, uh, 31. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we'll take a vote starting with Steve. Yes. Jean? No. Shana? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I may yes as well. Uh, so we will recommend favorable action on Article 31 with a vote of 4 to 1. And we will note the discussion in the um, Redevelopment Board report to town meeting. Okay. Um, the next item is Article 32, the zoning bylaw amendment related to traffic visibility. And um, Jean, I believe you had a discussion with um, uh, Mike Champa, the director of the um, Inspectional Services uh, Department. So if you wanted to start with comments, that would be fantastic. Fine. And uh, the email exchange with Mr. Champa is among the materials for tonight's Correct. meeting. Um, if folks had a chance to read them or not. Um, I, I asked uh, Mr. Champa two questions. One is, 
where is the correct line for where the fences have to go? You, you may recall that the petitioner put the line at the edge of her property, and then Ms. Solaretti indicated it should not be at the edge of the property, it should be at the curb, and then he later sent us an illustration from an old um, zoning bylaw that said it's at the curb. Uh, Mr. Champo was very clear that the petitioner had the triangle in the correct place, and Ms. Solaretti had the triangle in the wrong place that the wording of the bylaw was very clear that it was the property line, not the curb, except in the few instances where the curb might be the property line, and that uh, what Mr. Loretti sent the illustration was for illustrative purposes only and not technically something that drives a decision in the bylaw. So then the second question was, what about the proposal? Um, that the uh, petitioner made. And Mr. Champa's concern was that um, something that starts off as um, transparent may not become transparent later on. Bushes may grow, um, things may fog over, something like that. So he didn't like the idea, but he said if you're going to go ahead with it, you should put in when installed and in the future. So I passed that all on to the petitioner, Ms. Monahan, and she ended up with this language, which I think is very consistent with um, what Mr. Champa had suggested. It's limited to fences, so it's not buildings, bushes, or other structures. And it's limited to five <coughs> feet, and it has to be transparent enough when installed and in the future, not to hinder safe passage. Um, so but this is where we ended up. I think it's, if we think it's a good idea to allow owners to be able to put these fences up, this, I think, meets Mr. Champ's concerns. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Steve, any comments? Uh, yes. Um, well, I, I do. I read uh, Mr. Champa's memo and uh, Mr. Benson's correspondence to him. Um, I'll, I, you know, I take his his his, con his point of concern. Um, given that we have a performance standard in five three twelve B, it makes sense to have some. I think it makes sense to have something similar in five three twelve A. Um, and in this case, I, I think you know the the performance standard actually does a lot to clarify what that part of the bylaw is supposed to do. That said, I would prefer uh, Mr. Champa's wording. Um, if the petitioner is would be amenable to that, um, Mr. Champa's wording was, unless it can be shown that the building structure or vegetation will not now or in the future restrict visibility in such a way as to hinder the safe transit of a vehicle through the intersection. Um, to me, the, that's, it's a, it's a little more clear, it's a little more direct, direct, and it also is clear that it applies to vegetation as well as uh, a fence or a structure. Steve, so that I make sure before we um, ask the petitioner um, whether or not they would be amenable to that. So um, your suggestion is replacing, inspector, placing the entire underlined section with unless it can be shown that the building structure or vegetation will not now or in the future restrict restrict visibility through the intersection through the intersection yeah, yeah that is my suggestion madam chair okay um, let's we'll have discussion and then we'll and then we'll pose the, the question to you as to whether or not that would be acceptable um, Shana any uh, comments either on the proposed text or um, Steve's recommendation um, in support of the um, wording recommended by Mike Champa. Yep, um, so, so the vegetation piece uh, has, has always made me a little bit nervous. Um, I, I was able to get comfortable with this because of because because we walked it back, or because the petitioner was um, com was willing to walk it back to fencing, I think 
Mr. Champa's stated concerns about vegetation being difficult to maintain into the future in such a way that it does not hinder um, uh, visibility is is uh, very is is forefront in my mind as well. I think I think a fence is much more likely to be maintained in that way. Um, and so if and so if the language were be were to be changed um, to reflect Mr. Champa's um, wording, I might want to take out the vegetation piece. Um, it gives me a lot of pause the, that he's not comfortable with this provision. Um, yeah, it gives me a lot of pause that he's not comfortable. I, I had gotten there myself um, with the transparent fencing, and, but but I'm really on the fence, for lack of a better term, <laughs> now. Um, I, I agree with you in a lot of ways, Shane. I think that the building inspector is the one who was going to be, the building department is, is um, the one who enforces this provision, and, and I think it's, um, it certainly gives, gives me some pause if they're not in support of that, um, because obviously um, he is not stated, and I don't want to pre, pre you know, um, I don't want to put words into his mouth or, or, or assume whether he's concerned about the um, enforceability and the uh, ability um, of of his um, very very busy team to be able to um, support the um, adherence in the future of of this as well. Um, I agree with Shane. I think the, veg the vegetation piece gives me the, the most pause. Um, um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in how my fellow board members you know, uh, feel on this one too. Ken? Um, well, I, I think I stated it last time. But I'm a little concerned that it says transparent enough. Uh, you've got to give a percentage. I thought we talked about you know, 50%. 40% or whatever, whatever you feel like is fair. I'm not trying, I'm supportive of this, just got to give it a little more definition as opposed to transparent enough because it might be different and it might be different five years from now where someone else might interpret it differently. Uh, but let's, I'd rather make it clear enough where, you know, uh, do you have any suggestions? In, is it okay if we ask? Um, I mean, is she okay to change it to? Like, well, I mean, I think I think we need to decide rather than asking okay. that. You know, we need to come up with whether or not there is it rather than just throwing things out there. I want okay. to come to a. But um, that's that, that's my hang up right now. Okay. okay. If, if there was a definition of, of, tra of transparency, like fifty percent or whatever percentage you guys just talk about, and then that's then it's clear. That everybody understands what it is and. Right. My, I mean, my other question is whether this is, we're talking about two feet in, in difference, right? It's currently, um, there's, there's a, um, you are allowed to erect um, a fence or vegetation up to three feet. We're only going up to, to five feet. Is this, is this necessary for the challenges that we're coming up with in terms of defining what transparent is and, um, and again, given the, reservations that the Department of Inspectional Services has. So, question, um, now that we've kind of gotten around once, um, yep. would I be correct if I were to interpret, it, it's, I got the sense that um, Ms. Corbin Houston and Madam Chair, you preferred the petitioner's language. No, I do not. Ted? Um, I don't, but I, but I, <clears throat> do not like the um, inclusion of vegetation in Mr. Champa's language. So, so I like Mr. Champa's language, but would want to omit vegetation. Uh, okay. Uh, but I'm still not, I'm still not decided, even with the change in language. I'm, I'm really not certain. 
that's where I would come down. So the way I read it, it, the vegetation piece, is that you know it's specifically saying that it's something that cannot restrict the visibility. Yeah. So um, I, I actually like that piece. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. I I would like something that says except for a fence up to five feet in height that does not restrict visibility through the intersection. We that will not now or in the not, future. That will not now or in the future, thank you, restrict visibility through the intersection. I think we can't know what percentage visibility is enough. It's going to be something that ISD is going to have to look at. Um, and make a determination. So I, I, so mine is like an amalgam of what Mr. Champ so suggested you would suggest, and what Ms. Monaghan suggested. You would suggest, except for fencing up to five feet in feet height, in height um, that will not that now will or in, in the, the future, future restrict, restrict visibility, visibility in such a way to hinder the safe okay. passage of a vehicle through the intersection. That's what would be my suggestion. And I go back to the board with, is this necessary? The a fence of up to three feet is already allowed. Um, wh why, why do we need this for the additional what Ms., two feet? What Ms. Monaghan said to me, and I hope I get this right, is that if you're gonna have like a daycare or something, the fence has to be four feet high. If you wanna have a swimming pool, it has to be five feet high. And that's, at least is my understanding of where we ended up at five. Okay. Um, other thoughts on Jean's suggestion for wording or on um, the necessity of this? I still, I still like to see a percentage or something. Uh, it's, still, it's, so, it's still right now interpretive on, on somebody interpreting it. What, what's, what's the percent visibility of a chain link fence? I would say close to 90%. I just might guess at it. But you don't know. So the problem is we don't know and we can't put a number in. Yes, but if you look at a stockade fence or a picket fence and the pickets are, let's say, uh, every other four, you know, the pickets are four, uh, four inches and you leave the four inch space there, then you know it's 50%. I mean. But we don't know if 50% is adequate or not. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. But so maybe it's, uh, we have to find that out and we and we don't we don't accept this thing right now until we find out what that acceptable percentage is. But I, I just don't want to leave it vague like this because it's just, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay with this, but I just, I don't want to leave it vague like that. Sure. I just Googled transparency of a chain link fence just for argument's sake and, and again Google. So fence manufacturers are what's coming up and it's coming up at uh, 95 to 100% transparent. I think 100 is, optimist, is optimistic on their part, but 50% but is not is clearly not well, I, a I mean, I, fence, I, right? I don't know. Clearly, this board does not have, you know, the. Um, uh, I, I would, if we were going to recommend a percentage transparency, I would want to do so perhaps in concert with the transportation planner or, you know, somebody who, who, who deals with these types of, of items uh, regularly, which, you know, we don't have the benefit of doing before we take a vote this evening. You could not do it in a disciplined way tonight. Correct. And so I feel uncomfortable with, with that, and I'm, and I'm not, and I understand Ken's concern that enough or in such a way to, so you know as to hinder is is vague you know, if it doesn't bother me who has it why does it bother you you know i can say oh that five foot fence is fine it doesn't bother me for traffic it's subjective other thoughts 
like my alternative language, I think that the inspectional services can handle this. I'll concur with Mr. Benson. So the proposed language that you are suggesting is except for fencing up to five feet in height that will not now or in the future restrict visibility in such a way as to hinder the safe transit of a vehicle through the intersection. Correct. Uh, so I'll ask the proponent, would you have um, any uh, objections to um, altering your language to the, that language as proposed? I would not object to that. I would also note that while it would not be maximally disciplined, I think it would be a pretty safe thing if we wanted to add 90% language. Um, because I, I, I think, in my view, there's very little risk that 90% visibility or 90% transparency would be inadequate. Um, and while it might be a higher bar than is strictly necessary, I still think it would be an improvement of policy on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm personally uncomfortable with putting in a percentage without um, having any type of guideline. And you know, the last thing I want to do is promote chain link fences all over town. So I, I um, certainly don't don't want to um, go go down that road. Um, Ken, what are your thoughts about being able to support that language, or whether um, this isn't something that we would? your mind want to support it this time. I would, uh, can we ask, I mean, do it, like, just like the other one, can we have time to just see what is, what is. We decided we weren't going to, we took the vote tonight on the other one. We decided we did not have time to wait and see, and um, we, we don't. We have to um, take a vote at our next meeting on the report. And this isn't a board article. It's you know not the board's responsibility to come up with the um, transparency. Oh. It's up to the board, though, to determine whether or not this proposal, um, as proposed for the Warren article, is an improvement for the town and something that is necessary within the zoning bylaws. I'm not going to be supportive of this unless it's a percentage. And I, and I think I agree with you. I'm not going to want giving to percentage. I don't want to do that. Okay. And uh, uh, a percentage was requested before at, uh, at other meetings uh, for this. Uh, so okay. that would be my feeling on it right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, I heard it, but I agree. I think it's fine, but I just, I think having a percentage is important. Okay. Um, Sheena? Um, I don't think I can get supportive of this without more, um, without more emphatic support from, from uh, Mr. Champa. Thank you. Gene? Uh, I really have nothing to add. Uh, Steve? Nothing to add. All right. Um, I feel similarly to Shane. I think without um, the support of Inspectional Services, who is responsible for um, enforcing this, I, I'm having a hard time um, supporting it as well. Um, so is there a motion to uh, recommend no action on this, uh, on Article 32? So motion. Is there a second? Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Uh, no. Uh, Jean? No. Shana? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So the board will vote or will recommend no action on this article by a vote of three to two. Uh, the next article is Article 33, uh, which is related to rear yard setbacks in the business districts. And 
and uh, we will start discussion with Ken. Uh, I'm in favor of this uh, article. I think it makes sense. Uh, since we have increased the height of the buildings, uh, we did not take an account for adjusting setbacks. I think having the taller building sets it back at a higher uh, elevation it makes sense and it doesn't uh, add a burn of extra shadow on this. So I'm supportive of this. Thank you. Shana? Uh, I agree and have nothing further. Jean? I agree. I think the important thing is that what this is doing is just setting back the fourth floor where it would have been otherwise and it really doesn't change what the shadows are. I would just ask Claire that this be cleaned up in two ways. One is um, it's what's added shouldn't be bolded. It should just be underlined. And it should be after the 30 feet. So you can see that the 30 feet is being crossed out and the other one's taking the place. I think the presentation would look a little better if it was that way instead. Okay. But I think this makes sense. It doesn't increase shadows. It just steps back the building and back where it needs to be. Thank you. Steve? Uh, I'm also supportive. Um, you know, I think this will, it's a, I think this will, you know, has the potential to allow some more ground floor commercial space in mixed use and uh, may help make those kind of developments more economically feasible. And to be perfectly honest, I wish the petitioner had suggested this in the fall when we were making this change to begin with. Here, here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I agree with you. I think that this is certainly no, not any more detrimental than what's existing, um, and it does provide for more opportunity for an increase in ground floor commercial space. Um, so, is there a motion to approve Article, or excuse me, is there an a motion to recommend action for Article 33 with the um, with the uh, Scribner's revisions that were suggested by, by Jean with um, uh, moving the underlined section to below the uh, star with 30 feet and um, ensuring that that is not in bold text. Yes, motion for federal action, Article 33. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean? Yes. Shana? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We will recommend favorable action by a vote of five to zero for Article 33. And the last article is um, Article 34, residential uses. Um, I did receive, and I believe the other members of the board did as well, um, correspondence from the petitioner, and I will um, read this um, for record as well. It has also been posted with correspondence. Um, we've collectively decided that we would like to ask the Bo Redevelopment Board to recommend, and excuse me, this is from John Paul uh, Lewicki, one of the uh, proponents of the article. Um, uh, and I quote, we would like to ask the Redevelopment Board to recommend no action on Article 34. We are planning to do some thorough public outreach later this year and file a new warrant article for the 2025 town meeting. We very much appreciate the thoughtful com comments and suggestions um, and are confident that taking the time to get all the details right and receive more feedback will make this an even stronger proposal. Uh, so uh, any discussion starting with Kim? No. Sheena. Um, I really appreciate that the proponents brought this forward in the first place. I think uh, it, it attempts to address, it does address some important issues facing our town. Um, I think it was probably wise for them to step back um, and, and look for further public comment, um, but I do look forward to hearing from them again at some point in the future. Great. Thank you. Gene? I agree with what my colleague just said. Steve? Um, yeah, I, I also want to extend some gratitude to the petitioners for coming, bringing this forward and working with us. I felt it was a productive conversation, and I look forward to um, 
you know, just seeing what, you know, just seeing how this takes shape over time. Great, thank you. Um, and I also appreciate their um, recognition of the importance of public outreach and a thorough public process in bringing this forward in the future. Um, so with that, is there a motion to recommend um, no action for Article 34? Motion for no action on Article 34. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will vote no action on Article 34 by a vote of 5 to 0. And with that, we um, are uh, at the end of our uh, warrant article uh, for 2024 annual town meeting. Is there a motion to close uh, the public hearing for the 2024 annual town meeting? So motion. Okay. So, wait, are we closing or continuing? We are closing. We are uh, voting on our report, but it is a. We are closing the the public okay. hearing. Mm -hmm. Second. Uh, uh, great. We will take a vote, starting with uh, Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I am a yes as well. We have now closed the public hearing for the warrant articles for 2024 annual town meeting. Um, and with that. I will see if there is, we'll move to Article 3, which, or excuse me, agenda number 3, and I'll see if there is a motion to adjourn. So I motion. Is there a second? I will take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.